going to uh, give you guys the uh, AXRT installation protocol training. Um, I'm just going to start off with some uh, very quick uh, manufacturer's guidelines. Um, this is a very fast presentation. Uh, That's probably the shortest Orenco presentation you will ever hear. <laughs> Yeah. So, anyway, uh, so the AX20RT product, of course, we've got the model of it over there. Uh, I think most of you guys are aware of that product. Is our residential unit. That's our equivalent to an AX20. Uh, this is a pretty typical configuration. Uh, normally, we're using a, a single compartment um, concrete tank up front. Uh, key to notice, of course, is we have an effluent filter here. Uh, being sure we maximize our TSS reduction from the primary tank and it flows over to the RT unit uh, which again uh, we uh, accept a uh, flow from the tank and we have a research blend chamber there and we have a dose chamber on the back side. This is the same amount of media that you would see in an AX20, um, AX20 uh, residential pod. Um, so again this is a typical configuration for a four bedroom home. Uh, before you begin, of course, you want to discuss the system location and talk about operation and maintenance, um, as well as hopefully before the system's installed, uh, the homeowner has a, some sort of manual like a do's and don'ts guide. You know, we've got tons of those available, uh, something that lets them know, hey, you're on a septic system, uh, be careful about what you are putting down the drain. It's not the municipal sewer, so it's not an anything goes scenario. Do's and don'ts guide is part ah. of the paperwork that they get that they have to file before they get the permit issued. So if that happens before the homeowner is involved, then they also get a copy of it before you try to get it on. Yep. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt to remind them to read it um, so that they review it. So, uh, you know, if you're using it, if you have a repair scenario, one of the cool things about the RT is that if you have an existing tank, um, and we've, we run into this probably more over on our side of things, but you guys might too. Um, you've got a tank in the ground, but you've got a failed sand filter behind it, or even a drain field, um, and you decide to go with advanced treatment. Uh, this is just a list of existing, uh, pre-existing conditions we want to see. In other words, we want to be sure that the tank's going to work, uh, holds water, and we're not going to have any problems. And you can put that effluent filter in the tail end of it. Uh, that's actually probably one of the, that it's watertight and you can access that filter is probably the two biggest points out of it. Um, you know, obviously we want to use good tanks. We don't want to just uh, use a tank that's going to cause problems down the road. Uh, the reason behind that, of course, is that uh, uh, we have a communication system and most of the time when the, uh, even if a homeowner has a leaking tank, um, when the alarm goes off, Guess whose name is right above that button? Not the tank manufacturer. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Obviously, uh, um, when we're going through the uh, installation guide, U.S. pipe diameters. I know we're kind of close to Canada. No, we're not close to Canada. You guys up in Coeur d'Alene, they're close to Canada, so they got to be sure that they're using U.S. normal pipe, IPS size. And of course, you need to be a trained Advantex installer, which is what we're doing here. So the first step, uh, steps one through four, and if you want, you can turn in your handy dandy installation guide. Uh, talks about reviewing or sketching site plans, not planes, plans. I always like to leave that in there because uh, we're not reviewing planes. Um, usually most guys set, uh, sketch something out, at least have a plan so the homeowner's on board. I know guys that have gone to the extent of actually having the homeowner initial it. You know why? It's because when they decide that's not where they wanted it, you can say that's where you told me to put it. Hey. Also, uh, after you're done with that, of course, you're going to excavate and set the tank, um, install the risers, do a water test, and put that effluent filter. Uh, the only key point here is the effluent filters for the RTs. You see these slots in the top? That is a vented effluent filter. You want to be sure you've got that. If you don't have the slots, the unit doesn't vent, and then we're not happy. So if for some reason you don't see the slots, just let us know. We can send you out a cartridge. It's easy, not a problem. 
Steps five and six, of course, you're going to excavate. Um, we, I uh, believe, recommend over excavating about a foot around the unit. Uh, we would love for you to compact the bottom of that. Um, the, uh, you know, most guys will use just like a viper plate, and they'll use three quarter minus. Um, lay down three or four inches in the bottom, compact it, set it, and uh, what, what I always tell guys is that you've got the material, so it's good to backfill with the rock um, up to about the mid-seam at least. Uh, there is some language in there about native backfill, but hey, um, what I tell guys is no rocks. You know, obviously you don't want to damage the unit, um, and no clay, because as we all know, Clay doesn't know what size it wants to be. Um, it changes all the time, and that makes for a rough backfill material. Uh, when you install, we have counter buoyancy, and, and uh, you, you can do this a variety of ways. You can uh, flip, uh, I wish Matt was still here. I'm uh, pumping his infiltrator chambers here. Um, we've done this. Wow. <laughs> Old Spice, that's a, great. <laughs> we interrupt for a special Old Spice commercial. Um, so uh, you can do this upside down infiltrator pour concrete thing. I've actually done this on one. Um, it, it works okay. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but you can make it work. Uh, most guys will actually go down to the precaster and pick up the $20 reject C-grade curbing. Um, they've done that too. We also provide a fiberglass flange kit um, that you can use. Uh, what I tell guys is that these units are only uh, full of water up to about right here. And so if you are in a high water area, they can become very buoyant. Um, and so you want to be sure that you have those countermeasures installed if needed. So you're going to put that in. You're going to backfill. And, and this is probably the, one of the critical points is, is that when you backfill these things, fill them with water as you backfill. Um, they're not that heavy. Uh, in fact, uh, if you've got one sitting in the bottom of an excavation and it's not exactly how you want it, uh, usually you can put your foot up against the sidewall and your back against the unit and just give it a shove and it'll move where you want it to. So not that heavy, which means that when you're backfilling, of course, if you don't have some water in it, it can move around a little bit. And if you're like me and you want everything in a straight line and you start measuring middle points and marking for that straight line, do that kind of stuff. And then of course you're going to connect any transport lines uh, that are coming out of that. There's a, uh, of course the four inch line coming in and then if you have a either a two inch line gravitating out or any pressure lines going out you're going to connect those. You're going to finish your watertight test uh, which is just uh, filling the unit up past the mid seam. Um, basically it's a after shipping test of that seam. Um, again uh, I don't I do not know of a single unit that has ever failed this watertight test, even after going across the United States on a flatbed, but um, we still want you to check. Uh, you're going to connect the air vent, uh, which is on the um, outside of the unit. There's going to be a two inch grommet there, and you're just simply going to just push, push the two inch pipe through, um, install the splice boxes on the outside, and wire up the panel. After that, you're going to finish your backfill. And are there any questions? I told you, you will never see a shorter Aranko presentation. Savor it. That's about it. Al's going to go over, um, in Idaho, uh, you guys do some specifics, and you have a little bit different configurations, and so there's some additional little tricks. So I'm going to hand it over to Alan. Thank you, Scott. So we have, the main reason for this presentation is we have run into some installation problems and so the whole thing with this is two part. One of them is to give you guys a little bit of information, arm yourself with some of the details of the system and then the other thing obviously is to try to avoid some of the installation issues and let you guys know what kind of standards we have for these systems specifically. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our system and Ryan's system, and I'm not, I'm not trying to ditch Ryan's system, and I'm going to give Ryan an opportunity to, to defend it a little bit, because they do a lot more systems down here than we do, so they're obviously doing something right. But you've got a few issues that people complain about. I talk to people that own his systems, I talk to people that own our systems. I'm just going to go through each one of these, and again, Ryan, pipe in if, if you want to 
jump all over this because I really don't have a problem with it. <laughs> Smell and noise. Um, I'm going to say that we probably win this one because we don't, we're not moving as much air and we don't have a blower that's located next to the house that runs 24-7. We have a little pump that sits down in the tank and you can't even hear it. Some people complain about the noise. I'm assuming though, if the blower is located in an area where you know, it's not near you know, barbecue deck and that kind of thing, if it's properly located, it's really not an issue. Power cost, this is kind of a, an interesting comparison. And I used, I think, the 0.25 horsepower blower. Ryan, do you know if you guys are using that one or a different one or something smaller, bigger? You don't know? Most of them are a third horsepower. Third horsepower. So this is going to be a little off. But if it runs 720 hours a month, it's running watts is about 180. Monthly kilowatt hours is almost 130. If we're talking about eight cents per kilowatt hour, which is about what I pay in Coeur d'Alene, I don't know what you guys pay down here, but I think Idaho's average is right in there. You're looking at about $124.41. Now where Ryan gets me pretty good is he charges less for his service. So quite frankly, when you add factor power costs in on a yearly basis and you factor in the discount or, or the, the reduction in fees that, that he charges his customers, ultimately the, the yearly cost comes out fairly close. But we're running a lot less time. We're running a little bit bigger horsepower motor. So ultimately, we end up being about a hundred bucks less a month or a year. Well, then when that air compressor goes out, or that blower goes out, and it kind of replace one of those. But I know the air compressor ones I have to replace those all the time. I I don't know what your your replacement interval is for the for the blower, the air compressor. Our pump replacement interval is probably between ten and twenty years. We've got. Over 130 Advantex, 120 Advantex systems in the state of Idaho, and I've never replaced a pump yet. Some of them are over 10 years old. So again, I'm going to give us that one, I guess, at least in terms of power costs. So yearly life cycle costs, are you guys at 225 or 180 for your yearly fees to your clients? 199. 199. Okay, so I'm wrong. Uh, and I don't know how frequently you have to pump the tank, but because you've got an activated sludge process, essentially, I'm assuming it's a little more frequently than we do. And of course, you've got a yearly allocated blower replacement cost based on, I think I based that on five or seven years. So we could be slightly less here, primarily because of the power costs. We are more expensive, as I said, for the maintenance inspection fees, because we have more things to look at and more things to do, so it takes a little bit more labor. Our system's probably a little more accessible, but a little more complicated as well, because we have to clean the biotube effluent screen. And, well, there's no screen on the new one, so on some of them we have to clean the screen, but on these ones, the newer ones, we don't. So we'll pull the pump out, clean the screen on the pump. Inspect the sheets. In some cases, we actually bottle blood, brush the laterals, make sure they're clean and free, free of any bile slime. But aside from that, it's mainly just a visual inspection. Uh, check this common sludge in the septic tank and treatment tank. Did I miss anything, Dave? I don't think, I think you did. The only problems I've had with it, the other system was that when they didn't put a tank in front of them, they just plugged up really fast. It's, that's a requirement now, so they're, um, yeah. For both systems. Right, right. <clears throat> treatment effectiveness, I, I mean, this one's, Probably a toss-up. I talked to Ryan a little bit before this presentation about their treatment effectiveness. They've got exponentially more systems than we do in the ground, and they seem to be hitting their numbers as far as I know. I haven't actually looked at their treatment results. So, you know, we're, we're going head-to-head -head on that, I think, for the most part. Lids and access. We've got, you could call these pretty, but most people call them ugly. Most people don't want these on their site. This is a, a pretty giant... 20 square foot lid here. You've got some other lids for the septic tank. Ryan's got on his system basically the blower that sits above grade and a couple access ports. So I'm going to give this one to him because most people prefer, I think, less in your yard versus more. Have you had any complaints or compliments on that, Ryan? Or is that pretty consistent? They're all different. <laughs> Not every site's the same. We do, I think, tend. 
again, there's more going on in our system, but we do offer remote monitoring. Not all people sign up for this, but ultimately all they need is a phone line to plug into the panel as part of the fees, so it doesn't cost them any extra per se, unless they're actually paying for a phone line. There is an option to add an IP kit, which allows them to plug in an ethernet cable to the panel, but the IP kit has a cost. The panels don't come with that IP kit by default, simply because it's fairly expensive and the people with the phone line would be buying the IP kit and they wouldn't need it. So it's, it's a couple hundred bucks for that. So ultimately what I've actually done though for folks is save them money in service calls because the remote monitoring, when there's a problem, it'll call me, actually calls the website, the website sends me an email. I can log on to their site, I can see what's going on. In a lot of cases, I can address their problems over the phone. I've got two or three clients that have the remote monitoring connected. They always have a leaky toilet at least once or twice a month, and so the thing calls me and tells me that they've got what we call you know, high research override alarm. I call them up, they jiggle the handle. A couple days later, they're good to go. So ultimately, it's kind of nice because they're not getting a dumb alarm. They're not calling their service provider. They're not getting billed for someone to come out and take a look at it. <clears throat> Standard system components. Again, we basically have, and I'm going to talk about all these individually. We have the septic tank. We have the Advantech tech system. In the Advantech system, you can add a discharge pump in the secondary tank, and I've got that approved for pump to gravity or pressurized systems because of the surge flow that we have um, calculated back into the system. I just talked to a guy yesterday who has an Advantech system, but the guy that put it in bought a dose tank and pump, and he, he really didn't need to do that. We could have sold him the unit with the pump right in the tank, and we could have eliminated the cost, some of the cost of that. Um, of course, when you add a discharge pump, the panel itself controls both pumps, the pump for dosing the treatment and the pump for dosing to the drain field. And then the control panel, I'll have a picture of that here, we'll talk more. So we're exclusively getting tanks, or, or Larkin is the exclusive tank provider, and it's not because we've got some kind of lock-in with Larkin. He is doing us a huge favor by inventorying some of our Advantex units. Those go on the truck with the tank, those get delivered. But the reason that we're using Larkin's tanks is he's the only one in the state, even northern Idaho, that has Arenko's approval for their septic tanks. So they're really the only option other than Renko's tanks themselves, and those tanks are great tanks, they're just extremely expensive. So we're actually requiring a 1250 now, and part of the reason is, and the primary reason is, is that I think in a lot of cases I've seen, gone out to homes that are four bedroom homes, but you show up and it's the Taj Mahal, and so we wanna provide a little extra tankage we want to provide a little extra room in the tankage for that return flow for the denitrification that actually Scott talked about as part of the commercial program. It's the same principle. So we're denitrifying and converting that nitrate to nitrogen gas in the septic tank. So if we have a little bit more room, a little more retention time, we're gonna we're gonna do that in a bigger tank. The difference between the thousand and the twelve fifty at Larkin is about three hundred bucks. So our system just went up three hundred bucks, Ryan. Um, these are actually one piece tank, so they're a, a tub and top style. You've got a, a seam at the top, so they're less likely to leak and uh, allow infiltration to come into the tank, which is a huge deal for us because it's critical that we don't allow any additional flow other than what's coming out of the house because that's what the system is sized for. Um, these are sealed watertight. Scott talked a little bit about watertight testing. I know that never happens in Idaho. I'll just say it right now. I know you probably skin's crawling. But what? No. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. I don't think I've ever seen anybody. You guys may have done it on an on engineer spec or a requirement, but I don't think by default you guys typically watertight test the tanks. It's just not a common practice, which I wish at some point it would be. Because I know up in North Idaho we have one manufacturer whose tanks leak incessantly, and they've got an approved design, but they leak really bad in a lot of places. I've seen it personally. You fix them when they're leaking. That's, yeah, if you find out. Of course, with this system, you'll typically find out that it's leaking through the Vericom and through the alarms. A standard septic system, you're gonna be sending a bunch of groundwater out to the drain field. If the groundwater gets that high, of course, 
those tanks are typically the, the middle seam type tanks, and so those tanks will possibly leak in or out. This tank will pretty much is limited to leaking out or in, excuse me. <coughs> Access risers and lids. We're actually using the ultra rib risers. We've, we've uh, given Larkin a, a big stick of riser material, so he's going to cast those in every tank. There's a couple different lids that fit on those, and he provides a couple different options for that. We are not allowing the polylock risers, and the reason is, and I apologize, but they are just absolutely trash. I'm not dogging someone else, but, but, but typically I see the riser, no, that wasn't very good. The riser itself is split, where the bolts go down into it, it's really thin, they're really flimsy. I think you guys talked about them kind of snaking up if you use quite a few on top of each other. I don't think they seal that well. Just not impressed with them. Plus, when you're using your, your drill driver kit, those Allen bolts strip out, or not Allen bolts, but the square head bolts strip out really quick and easy. So it just is a hassle if you've got to continually get into those risers. So this is the only thing that's going to come on the tanks. They're typically going to come with a 12-inch riser because that's how the elevations come out on most of these. If you have 12-inch risers on the tank, you set the fall out of the tank over to the Vantex system correctly. You know, if it's a pre flat site grade, it's going to be right there for you. So, what's critical about that? It's critical where you're coming out of the house. You got to make sure that's high enough. These risers also, um, some of you guys are using the poly risers, the hand core. Is yeah, that right? Sure. The problem with those is they don't have, as far as I know, a good method for extending those. They don't have a watertight, epoxy bound method for actually putting extension. You can obviously stack them, but you've got a seam there that possibly could leak groundwater into it. These, we have a methodology for extending them, which is a, a grade ring adapter and some epoxy, so you can add more risers onto these if you need to because of the landscaping or whatever may be the case in, on the site to bring them up to grade. Again, these all these risers must be up to grade. Now, I see a lot of them installed, and the lid is right at grade, so when you pull the lid off, a bunch of dirt and grass gets stuck in the gasket. It'd be nice to bring it up a little ways. Of course, you run into problems with the mowers hitting them, and people run, run them over with, with the mowers and breaking the edges off and stuff, but it's, it's better to have them up a little ways so they're not just exactly flush. The effluent filter, in this case, Scott talked about it a little bit, but the effluent filter comes with the tank, so it's going to be the right one. It's going to be the Orenco effluent filter. It's not going to be the pipe cleaner one. And the reason is, is because they've got an effluent filter that has more square area typically than some of the alternatives and so they really want to make sure that that's screened and properly maintainable on a yearly basis as opposed to maintaining it more frequently. And it needs to be accessible through the riser and lid. So this is going to be most typically the outlet of the septic tank itself right before the Advantech system. So that's going to screen the effluent from the septic tank before it goes into the AX. This is kind of what it looks like if you pull it out, although I don't show the bottom, but you can kind of see the bio tubes. Most of you guys have seen those. On the nitrogen reducing systems, we're installing a nitrogen return line. Out of the Advantex system, there's a port. If we buy the right system or the, the right system gets delivered, where all you've got to do is glue a one inch schedule at uh, 40, or schedule A if you want, pipe into it and pipe that across the Advantex system and back across the top of the tank to the front end of the tank where the very first sanitary T is. So we're going to come through the wall of the riser. We want to use some methodology to seal that, which we're going to be using a grommet in this case, most typically. We want to have either a ball valve or a gate valve here, a union after the gate valve, a 90 degree elbow, and then we need to drop that right down into the sanity. And I like to I'd like to provide a gap of approximately one inches before the surface of the water. So when that thing returns, it doesn't siphon back, but it doesn't break up the, the scum layer in the septic tank. So if we routed this straight into, just straight into here, what do you think would be wrong with that? It's going to stir up the solids. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the sanitary tea on this site anyway, is to make sure the solids basically stay in place. We are actually able to regulate the return flow to try to improve our, our denitrification and try not to you know, increase the dissolved oxygen in the septic tank because, you know, that's obviously the environment that we're wanting to create there. 
So with that gate valve, it's essential to allow him or whoever the service provider is to, to make those adjustments there. So a couple different configurations, and I've got some drawings of these as well. The AX20RTA mode three. So we can kind of go through this nomenclature, but Scott already talked about this 20 square feet basically of media. The AX is Advantex, the RT is the, the, the unit, the model. A is single pump and mode three is nitrogen reduction return line. So in this case, again, we got our media in, in one tank. This whole thing's one tank basically. You get the media levitated over the liquid zones. Um, the pump here doses up over the, the AX media. It trickles down through this. Some of it falls back into the research blend tank, if we want to call it that. The rest of it trickles down into the dose side. And again, you have kind of a level seeking situation here because you've got this trap return valve like we have on the AX Max units that Scott talked about earlier, as long as that opens. Um, and then of course you've got floats in here that don't actually dictate the liquid level, but give us alarm feedback and also provide other functions if there's a problem. So this is size for up to a four bedroom home. I'm gonna say 3,000 square foot, but not on nitrogen systems. So any nitrogen system we're going with now the larger unit so we can ensure that we're nitrifying. One thing that Mike is finding though is on the residential systems, our problem isn't necessarily with nitrifying, it's with denitrifying. So we may make an exemption to providing the X20 units on systems that are require nitrogen reduction because it seems like the limiting factor is not the volume of media. We talked about that after I put this slide together. These can be operated in 115 or 230 volt operation. This is specifically in this case a gravity discharge unit and again, we talked about the nitrogen return. So the nitrogen return comes off the pump, discharge, comes out the side of the unit, and then heads back to the septic tank front end. So the next system we'd like to talk about is the AX20RTB mode three. This is the standard AX20 uh, 20 square foot media filter unit. It does have a discharge pump on the other side of this pump it's not shown here's the outlet here this is uh, specific for situations where we're going to be pumping to a drain field where we can't get gravity out of the system and everything else is basically the same except for that discharge pump of course with this model you're going to order the correct panel to operate not only the Advantex pump but the discharge pump as well this unit size for again up to four bedrooms, 3,000 square feet, and we're not using these uh, on nitrogen system all systems. Although we've decided to possibly reconsider that based on information we got from Mike, uh, they do operate in 115 or 230 volt. And this one uh, with the mode three is configured for nitrogen return. The pump to discharge itself is 46 inches from the bottom of the tank and 26 inches from the top of the tank, although that doesn't matter a whole lot simply because you can obviously pipe that to wherever it needs to go. The AX25RTA, which again is the RT system with 25 square feet of media. This will be sized up for a six bedroom home, 5,000 square feet or five bedrooms on nitrogen reducing requirements. This has the mode three, so it's a return line, and this is a gravity system. Uh, same AX25RTB, mode three. In this case, we have a discharge pump that actually pumps to the drain field, and it has the additional five square feet of media to accommodate the larger size homes. So some of the program requirements that we have for the Advantex program in Idaho, we're going to talk about now. The member packet that we provide to every customer, whether it's the contractor, builder, or homeowner, includes three documents that have to be signed, notarized, and recorded on the deed of the property, and then ultimately submitted to the health, health district and back to us. They are the member agreement, 
which makes essentially the homeowner a member of the nonprofit as required by DEQ for these systems. The easement, the easement itself allows someone access to the property to do the maintenance on the system. The maintenance inspection agreement basically is the agreement between the nonprofit and the property owner. Um, all, as I mentioned, need to be submitted to after they've been recorded and the recording mark has been placed on them, need to be submitted to the health district and a copy needs to be sent back to Idaho Onsite Services. Also, Idaho Onsite Services would like a copy of the permit once it's issued so we understand specifically what the treatment requirements are for the particular property. If we don't receive that permit, then we have no way of knowing what to test for when testing time uh, comes up. Delivery and installation. These systems are typically in southern Idaho delivered with uh, the Larkin tanks. And so Larkin actually has, as I mentioned, a few on site and they can deliver those at the same time they deliver the Larkin tanks. The control panel comes from Coeur d'Alene. And again, as we mentioned before, we're not going to release these systems until those documents are actually provided. So if you call Ken and ask him to deliver one of these and we don't have the documents, you're not going to get it until we do. The startup on these systems, we would like um, every system to be started up by the O&M provider. In this case, we are going to start these systems up, have Mike Black do it basically in District 3 and 4. The cost is $200. In the other districts, uh, we have other people that can do that for you. Uh, Mike will produce a document that the health district's looking for in order to get a sign off to get a certificate of occupancy and until that document's submitted to the health district the system won't be signed off on. And in a lot of cases there are issues that are corrected during the the sign off and so or during the initial startup and so of course you know Mike and, and his crew can look through the system make sure it's been installed correctly make sure it's running correctly get the timer settings set up appropriately so the system um, has a good chance of performing well in the future for the homeowner. And it's also not a bad idea for the installer and the uh, the O&M provider, Mike, that comes out to have a little meeting with the homeowner, talk about uh, some of the issues with the system, what are the do's and don'ts, the requirements of the system, the testing. In a lot of cases we find that this conversation is not made with the homeowner so the homeowner has a difficult time understanding what the program requirements are. This just gives them a little bit more information so they can you know again understand what happens, how this works, how frequently it's tested, what happens when Mike comes out to do the testing, what they need to do in the house to make sure the system passes. So when the homeowner moves in, we also, as Idaho Onsite Services, need to be notified because uh, that is the day essentially the clock has started. We need to test the system uh, sometime within the first six months or sometime after the first six months of occupancy. So we usually schedule the next uh, sampling um, schedule, which is either spring or fall. So if we don't get this call and Moving day happens if people move in and we don't hear from them for a year. Uh, typically we'll be calling them before then if we know the system has been installed. But if it, we don't, if it slips through the cracks, we may never know and ultimately the system may be getting a call by the regulator asking why it hasn't been tested. And of course we have no idea that it's actually ever been occupied. So it's a, it's a very important step in the process. Some of the common installation issues that we've seen, in this case, this is a pod that got caught in a little brush fire that got away from a guy. Um, kind of bad situation for sure, obviously for him. Um, but the biggest problem we see is control panel placement. If the electrician puts a control panel on the wall of the home and that wall is adjacent to a bedroom or other living area, you could end up with issues with the homeowner complaining about the magnetic contactor banging on and off all night long because the system does run continually through the timer settings and so they are not going to be happy about that. The solution is to mount that control panel either on a wall that's for example a garage wall or something you know that's not a living wall, living space wall or mount the control panel on a treated post somewhere.
as I mentioned. And there are a few things we can do to buffer the sound with rubberized grommets and mounting, but that normally, the sound would typically carry through that at least to some level. So the poor system placement, in this case we've got an Advantec system and septic tank set just off the front patio, of the, or the rear patio of this place, and of course you can see the barbecue, so the homeowner, their intention is to go out and do some barbecue and out by their sewer system. The more appropriate placement would have probably been around the corner. In this case, the solution probably would have required the discharge pump option. This is a gravity system, and in a lot of cases that obviously adds cost, so most people are resistant to that. But in, in uh, this particular case, if a discussion would have been made with the homeowner, he'd have been happy to pay the extra to get the discharge pump option if he could have put it around the corner. Um, poor elevation. This particular system was set in the yard and then grade had been brought up around it so it ultimately ended up being in a pool of water. Uh, the solution to this was a 12 inch riser extension on the top of the tank which is about a $900 to $1000 adder. Uh, hopefully these situations can be avoided by properly grading the system and setting it appropriately to what would be hopefully planned finish grade. Once again, we got a system that's a little hard to tell from the picture, but set in a low spot. The septic tank is also in a low spot, so when runoff occurs at this particular location, the tank will be uh, possibly flooded, depending on how quickly the water drains off. Uh, the solution to this, obviously, would be to just siting, siting it into a different place, get the, get the gravity fall appropriate so it's not in the low spot, but hopefully in an area that's not going to see a lot of groundwater. The solution could be that adder, the $1,000 12-inch riser adder, or moving the system. In this case, the system was moved. So the other issues we experience is leak, leaky tanks, risers, or tank penetrations. Now, as you can see from this illustration, you know if you've got high groundwater up around the system, you could get leaks through tank seams, riser connections, pipe penetrations, which is this here as well, um, that additional water can lead to a problem or failure in the treatment system and septic tank, so these things are to be avoided. This is one of the reasons why we're so adamant about the types of tanks we use, the types of riser connections that come on the tanks, and the procedures for uh, sealing around piping penetrations that come through the tank itself. So that's it for the presentation. Um, this last little bit was added because we missed the very end of the video at the, I, the OWAI conference. And so obviously we don't have any opportunity for questions today.